you please come inside and occupy your seats as we are about to start our next eminent speaker ca dinal shah is here with us ladies and gentlemen we welcome you once again post for the post lunch session the sixth technical session on critical issues in respect to assessment under the income tax act 1961 by ca dinal shah sir for which i request advocate rupesh shah chairman kit committee past president itba and advocate bharat jani past president of both the association to escort the dignitaries uh, advocate k h kathiria ca piyush panchal invitee member agftc advocate parth kathiria committee member itba advocate dipesh Shak uh, shakwala invitee member agftc ca ritesh gandhi co chairman finance committee along with our esteemed speaker ca dinal shah sir on to the day get bharat jani past president of agftc and itba to welcome our speaker with a book I also request Advocate Rupesh Shah, Chairman Kit Committee and Past President ITBA, to present Sri Dinar Shah Sir with a memento. Thank you, Sir. I now take this privilege to introduce and then invite our eminent speaker for today's session. Honorable CA Dinal Shah sir is a successful chartered accountant and has more than 25 years of experience in advising clients on taxes taxation exchange control and regulatory issues he is the partner at Erzin Young one of the leading tax and corporate firms in the whole world he is an executive committee member of international fiscal association and the secretary of ITAT bar association He was a central council member of ICAI and was chairman of direct tax committee of GCCI. He has also addressed and presented papers at various seminars and conferences on international taxation, non-resident taxation, transfer pricing, domestic uh, taxation, accounting standards, insolvency and bankruptcy code and evaluation standards, etc. He is a regular contributor. to articles of uh, at the institute and other professional journals please welcome with a huge round of applause honorable ca dinal shah sir sir i request you for your address sorry first of all let me thank uh, all gujarat federation and it bar for giving me this opportunity initially i thought to speak something on faceless but then i also heard tushar yesterday he had given some perspective on the faceless assessment i just wanted to supplement on next 2 3 minutes on certain issues which i am facing right now from a faceless assessment or an appeals perspective and going forward from april 21 once the finance bill 21 is passed you may also have the faceless itat there are different views between the law minister and the finance minister on what will be the faceless itat but let's see ultimately what happens for the first time at least in my professional practice the department has filed a caveat before the high court for the potential read if any being filed by itat by association and therefore they have actually filed a caveat before high court and has been served formally on the itat bar two days back so something in offing after the budget is passed after the itat appeals are being the scheme is notified and let's see how it goes from the scheme perspective but there is a fundamental question between a uh, powers of the law ministry versus power of the finance ministry because as we know the itat is under the ministry of law whereas the entire sections on the itat powers is being drafted monitored 
amendments are proposed by the Ministry of Finance and therefore between Ministry of Finance and Law Ministry there will be some clash of powers but in a lighter tone we all know that everything ends at one place and therefore whether it is Ministry of Law or whether it is Ministry of Finance in effect it doesn't make any difference because everything gets merged at one place. From a faceless perspective, I have two or three practical suggestions and I can only share with you my practical experience. One, that some officers are very good and they raise very, very pertinent questions after reading your financial statements, after reading your submissions. And their issues are very interesting sometimes. Sometimes you feel that how, why he has asked this particular question but after reading through the notice, after reading through a perspective, you actually feel that the issue is, rel is interesting and some good questions are being asked. But at the same time, there is also other class of people where without understanding the issue, without understanding the financials, business or the nature of issue itself, they raise certain questions in the, in the notice and then they don't give even a time to face or to response to that notice in a timely manner. But three things becomes very critical. One, your quality of submissions. And that becomes very, very relevant now, particularly. And in practice, I can share with you what happens is, you know your client, you know the issue, everything. But the other side doesn't know this. Now, we prepare a submission in such a way as if I have to argue to myself. Now that perspective to change because what you are communicating is to a third party who doesn't know the SSE, who doesn't know the issue in complete, he doesn't have a background and therefore to the extent possible if you are able to align your financials, your tax audit report, your any other reports and your submissions, people would be able to appreciate a perspective. For example, depreciation schedule. Last year closing balance become an opening balance of the current year. But in the ITR 6 there is a difference of 1 rupee. Now because of that 1 rupee, the computer throws out that the closing balance of the return on value does not match with opening value of the next year. And therefore then there is an issue. But if you explain the closing balance and the opening balance and say that this is nothing but a rounding of error, then the issue gets closed. For example, yesterday I was reading some submission the notice on the capitalization of the foreign exchange to the cost of assets and claiming an additional depreciation. He was completely lost and he could not understand why are you claiming additional depreciation, what is the law on additional depreciation, why are you, why are you doing all this. And then when you explain with tables, with figures and reconciliation, I think the other person would be easy to understand from him and therefore the most important is that how do you communicate to the other person in a more lucid, more straightforward and more correlation of data between different documents that will actually help the other person to understand. The second issue is on the reliance on the decisions and the judgment. Now I have learned when I started practice in 91 that you should not refer judgments of tribunal high court unless the issue is straightway crystal clear that whether it is X or Y but if it is completely based on facts then you should avoid giving reference to judgments because sometimes what happens maybe 10% cases the other officer is so competent hard working you refer 5 judgments and he will throw it you to another 10 judgment to say that what you are saying is not right. And then when you go in appeal, you are defending not five judgments, you are defending 15 judgments. It is exactly similar to your transfer pricing comparables company. And therefore, to the extent possible, I always use not to refer the judgment in the assessment proceedings unless it is an issue is very crystal clear by the jurisdictional high court or a tribunal or by the Supreme Court. But now under the faceless assessment, since the other person you don't know what view he will take, since the other person is not out of Gujarat, he is in some other jurisdiction, if it is directly relevant to that particular issue, it may be advisable to refer that particular judgment, but two things are very important. One, 
प्लीज रीड दैट जजमेंट एंड द फैक्ट्स एंड योर फैक्ट्स एंड ट्राई टू कंपेयर दैट व्हाट इज द फैक्ट्स अंडर डिस्कशन एंड व्हाट इज द फैक्ट्स ऑफ दैट जजमेंट एंड देन ट्राई टू से दैट आई एम कवर्ड बाय दिस पर्टिकुलर जजमेंट मेनी टाइम्स इन अ हरी इन इन अ शॉर्टेज ऑफ टाइम वी गो बाय द हेड नोट्स एंड वी रिप्रोड्यूस हेड नोट्स विथ फिफ्टी जजमेंट्स और ट्वेंटी जजमेंट्स विथ हंड्रेड पेज सबमिशन but any of the judgments may or may not be relevant to that particular issue neither officer has a patience to read that judgment and he doesn't know and he will only make a simple statement of fact that the facts are different than the facts under consideration and then you go and litigate at the cit appeal and then they do next level and therefore if you want to refer certain judgments please refer after due care after comparing the facts sometimes if you only go by head notes only go by few paras For example, recently, before five days, the Supreme Court delivered a landmark judgment on the software. I will deal with that particular issue. But if you read the facts, para four of the judgment, it is only covering four particular situations. It is not a sacro saint that TDS is not required to be directed on a software. It is only applicable to those four situations which are given in para four of the judgment, and therefore. you will have to restrict yourself to the facts of that particular issue and the judgment of the higher court and then refer that particular judgment to a issue the third thing which i am seeing in the notice is as late as today morning that for every case they try to initiate a penalty under 270 subsection 8 of a misreporting they are not treating as under reporting at all in their language is misreporting in the nature of under reporting now i don't understand what is that language it can be either under reporting under subsection 3 or subsection 8 of a misreporting it can be misreporting in the nature of under reporting and the caution which you need to take is that the moment they try to initiate a penalty in a draft report you need to put forward that you don't fall into a misreporting like suppression of facts or giving a wrong information it may be a debatable issue you he may not agree with you he may not agree with your submissions of the facts but ultimately because otherwise you are not even governed by section 270 double on the immunity and then you will litigate for next 5 years on and now the penalty scheme is also on the faceless and therefore again the challenge will come from the department on misreporting and which is all as i as 200% compared to 50% on the under reporting and therefore you will have to make that efforts to at least substantiate that it does not fall into misreporting it may be a bona fide difference of view it may be a bona fide judgment issue but it is not that you are not giving the correct fact you are not you are not suppressing the facts or you are not giving a false evidences or the false statement for the purpose of submission i have picked up some seven or eight issues which i believe are relevant and which i believe that it is a uh, issues which which we all deal day in day out into assessment or also in the practice so let me first take an issue of the foreign exchange foreign exchange falls into two or three categories and if i take first an accounting issue either under as 11 or under indas you export the goods you import the goods both the accounting principle says that at the end of the year you need to restate your current assets and current liabilities so for example i would have exported on 1st february 2021 and exchange rate was 73 rupees and on 31st march 21 the exchange rate is 75 rupees on 31st march 21 i have to debit 2 rupees pnl and credit to the debtor and therefore when i do that entry the question is that whether the 2 rupees which is debited to pnl is it a foreign exchange loss allowable under section 371 or it is a contingent liability and which is what the department has been claiming that all mark to market losses are a contingent liability the second issue is that i borrow money in foreign exchange i take external commercial borrowing from any private bankers or any scheduled banks and every year i need to restate that liability on 31st march and i have a gain or loss accounting principle requires me to credit gain or loss to profit and loss account and therefore the question is that whether that gain or loss is taxable or not 
the third situation is that i borrow money for acquisition of an asset either an imported assets or the domestic asset and then when i use that money for imported assets what happens to the foreign exchange gain or loss and if i use that for a domestic or an indigenous assets what happens to the gain or loss subject to section 43 capital a and the fourth situation is the forward contracts i export the goods i entered into a forward contracts to hedge my risk and on 31st march 21 i need to do a mark to market of that forward exchange contracts i need to amortize the premium which i pay and the accounting treatment under india and es is completely different what do i do with the forward exchange gain and the last category is the hedging transactions in the nature of the firm commitment contracts i have an export firm commitment i have not exported the goods i will export in the month of may 21 i entered into a firm commitment contract with the with the bankers on 31st march i have to do a mark to market as per accounting principle what happens to that loss on 31st march 21 or a gain on 31st march 21 and the sixth category i have invested into overseas entity under the odi scheme by any company private limited partnership i invested at 60 rupees today i get money when i liquidate my do a buyback in the foreign in the foreign company or a capital reduction i close that company and i get the money back today i get the money at 73 what happens to the 13 rupees a gain which i make today the first issue on restatement of creditors and debtors which is a simple and straightforward issue the supreme court settled that issue in woodworth governor to say this is an ascertain liability it is a mark to market restatement of liability and that gain or loss is eligible but with all respect today yesterday some officer raised that issue in faceless why this gain or loss i'm sorry the loss is not allowable as a deduction under 371 now you have section 43 double a and also the icds in the foreign exchange which is mandatory under section 145 2 and therefore that gain or loss on restatement of creditors and debtor is an eligible loss or if it is a gain it is a taxable gain on a revenue account the second category that i borrow money and i use for my working capital purpose whether that restatement of a liability on a capital account is taxable or not prior to assessment year 1718 the law was settled to say that this gain or loss is on capital account it is a borrowing it is on capital account and therefore it is not taxable as gain or the loss is not deductible and that was also settled by many many high courts post assessment year 1718 after the icds and section 43 double a this gain or loss both is taxable or deductible on a revenue account and therefore this does not remain now on a capital account it becomes a revenue item read with section 43 double a and the icds the third category i borrow money for the purchase of assets i use for the purpose of imported assets i use for the purpose of indigenous assets the law says that if it is used for the purpose of imported assets then the mark to market loss is now allowed to be capitalized to the cost of the asset it is allowed to be capitalized to the cost of the asset only in the year of realization so i would have borrowed in 17 but i actually repay the liability today the loss is realized today i will have to add that amount to block of assets in the current year 2021 and i will claim a depreciation only to the extent of imported assets but if it is used for the purpose of indigenous asset then the supreme court in tata steel the supreme court in tata motors confirm the view that it is on a capital account the loss is neither deductible nor it is allowed to be capitalized it's a pure pure capital loss it does not add to the cost under section 431 and therefore that was a complete capital account loss not allowed to be capitalized or deductible post assessment year 1718 now that loss is a deductible loss even if it is for indigenous assets that loss is on revenue account so loss is deductible the gain is taxable 
you can't capitalize to the cost of the asset you can't claim as on capital account it is a taxable gain or a deductible loss the fourth item is on the forward contracts again the icds on 43 aa read with icds para 5 says that all such loss is on hedging account mark to market gain is taxable mark to market loss is deductible provided it is an underlying contract you have already made an exports the fifth category is a firm commitment the firm commitment contracts are where i have actually not done the exports i am going to make an exports in the month of may 21 the icds says the law says that this mark to market gain or loss is deductible or taxable in the year of realization and not on mark to market basis so to that an extent for accounting purpose i will have to debit pnl or credit pnl but for the tax purpose i will have to offer the tax or claim deduction only in the year of realization which is next year of 21 22 financial year and the last item is on the non monetary items on investments i would have invested at 55 60 rupees in overseas country today i am getting at 75 it was a settled law by Supreme Court to say that that is 15 is on capital account. It's a non-monetary item, not taxable as gain, not deductible as a loss. Post assessment year 1718, this gain is taxable. If you read section 43 AA, subsection 2, clause 1, it says monetary items and are non-monetary items. And what is non-monetary items is defined in ICDS. And therefore, all such gains or loss even on capital account will now become deductible or a taxable gain so in substance except a borrowing for an imported assets all gains and loss are now on a revenue account it is either taxable or deductible except in the year in which it is realized or in case of a firm commitment Otherwise, everything is now become on a mark to market taxable or deductible and therefore one will have to take care particularly on this foreign exchange. The next issue is on borrowings. On the borrowings, section 36.1.3 read with ICDS, read with section 145 subsection 2. The law is reasonably settled on borrowing cost but because of the Supreme Court judgment in core health care, the substantial dilution was made to the borrowing cost provisions. And today, every day, the every showcase notice have an issue. Have you capitalized the interest on the ICDS? Have you, why interest should not be disallowed under section 14A? And why do I not apply rule 8 D for the purpose of past years, 17, 18, 18, 19, 1920? Supreme Court said in core health care, that any money borrowed for the purpose of business is allowable post commencement of a business. Supreme Court also said that explanation in A2 section 43.1 is applicable only up to a point where you commence a business. It does not apply post commencement of a business. And therefore, subsequent judgment of a Supreme Court in Alembic Chemicals, which says that I have factory here. I put up a factory new, I borrow money, entire interest is allowed as a revenue deduction under section 36.13. But after the core healthcare judgment from assessment year 4-5, a proviso was inserted to say that if you use money for the purpose of expansion of a business, then to that an extent you need to capitalize the interest. But if it is normal purchase of a plant and machinery, normal purchase of an asset, normal purchase of a vehicle, it is all on revenue account. It is not in connection with expansion of a business. And normally all of us know what department does. If you have a capital work in progress, he will do opening balance, closing balance, averaging out, apply the interest rate and disallow. Now which is completely wrong. It is now also settled by all tribunals and high courts that this is not relevant unless it is an expansion of a business. But after the ICDS from assessment year 1718, the word expansion of business is also deleted in the proviso to section 3613. Now, if I borrow money 
specific to a particular asset. So let's take an example. I go and buy a Maruti car and I borrow from State Bank of India. The money is released today, but I get the possession of the car after five days. Technically, I need to capitalize five days interest to the cost of the vehicle. This is exactly what 3613 read with ICDS provides. But if it is not a direct interest or a direct borrowing, if it is a normal working capital or book debt interest, then similar to Rule 8D, there is a formula of opening balance of assets, closing balance of assets, that is eligible assets, eligible assets of the 31st March, doing averaging and apply the average rate of interest. And then allocate that interest to different class of assets like building, machinery, vehicle, furniture. But there, there is one caveat. The law says that if the asset has taken a time, is expected to take a time more than 12 months, then only you need to capitalize the interest. So same example of a vehicle, instead of borrowing directly from State Bank of India, if I use working capital fund for the purpose of buying a vehicle, I am not required to capitalize the interest. Because I fall into a second category of the capitalization of interest. The car has not taken more than 12 months time to get it operational or put to use. And therefore, I am not required to capitalize the interest on a car. But if I borrow specifically, then I will require to capitalize the interest. I don't get that 12 months of window for the purpose of capitalization of an interest. And this is one issue where department is push pushing hard on the capitalization of an interest under section 3613. The next issue is on tax refunds. We have an ICDS on contingent liabilities and provisions, ICDS 10. The law says, that if you make a provision for a reasonable certainty on a scientific basis, then that provision is allowed as a deduction, similar to a graduate liability, superannuation fund, prudent fund liability, leave encashment, but this is all subject to 43B. Or a classic example is a warranty provision covered by Supreme Court judgment in rot of control. But when it comes to a contingent asset, it says virtual certainty. And there is a distinction between a reasonable certainty and a virtual certainty from an accounting perspective. Reasonable certainty means I expect that reasonably this claim will be settled in my favor. Virtual certainty means it is as good as I have won the claim. The ICD has changed this principle. Even on contingent asset, it says reasonable certainty. I was reading a judgment of a Polyflex India Private Limited or Supreme Court. The issue was that the SSE got the excise refund. The question was that whether that excise refund is taxable under 41.1, though the department has disputed the granting of refund of the, uh, bef uh, of the excise before the Supreme Court and the matter is separately pending in the Supreme Court whether I should be eligible to get a refund or not. But in between, I won before an high court and I got the refund. The question is whether it is taxable or tomorrow if the Supreme Court reverses the judgment on that excise, I will have to refund that amount with interest. Will I claim the deductions under section 371? The Supreme Court said, in Polyflex, that section 41.1 says, has obtained any benefit during the year? Have I received an amount of refund to my bank account? The answer is yes. Tomorrow, if the Supreme Court decides otherwise on my main matter, I may have to refund that money, but in that year, department will have to grant me a deduction because I have already paid tax today. But I can't go and argue with the department to say that ma the main matter is pending before Supreme Court and therefore I will not offer this for taxation. Now why I'm raising this issue that I have seen many, many audit reports and the balance sheets 
where people receive certain amount a tax refund from either GST refund or a service tax refund or an excise refund or a VAT refund, but the issue is under debate or litigation and therefore they don't offer for taxation. You have a tax audit para in para 13 and 14 which says that any amount which is not credited to profit and loss account, it will also fall that amount into that para and therefore one will have to take care, particularly when you sign an audit report or when you do not offer this income for taxation, if you have already received the refund. And this principle is exactly now confirmed by ICDS to say the moment you have received the amount, you will have to offer for taxation, you may claim deduction in the subsequent year. And therefore all these tax refunds will become, and we know that particularly for income tax refund, it is issued on 29th March, it is adjusted against earlier demand, and whenever you go for an assessment, they will say, why did you not offer interest under 244A? Now technically, I will have to offer interest under 244A. Tomorrow if the refund is withdrawn, I may have to repay that with 234D. But that's a subsequent action. As a first step, I will have to offer that amount for taxation for the purpose in the year in which I have received the refund. And therefore this amount, both from an auditing perspective and from a tax perspective, when we will have to take appropriate care. The next is section 56 to 7b and 56 to 10. It is a topic by itself. I don't want to go into that topic in detail, but I only wanted to highlight two or three issues which I am facing in day in, day out. And I was reading a Delhi Echo judgment yesterday evening, which is very good judgment on these principles. 56 to 7b says, that any company in which public are not substantially interested receives any amount towards share capital and when it receives that amount at a premium which is higher than the fair market value then that excess amount will be taxable as income under 56.27b. Interestingly this section is only applicable for an amount received from a resident. So if I am a company where I receive money from a non-resident or I receive from a foreign company, then 56.27b does not apply. This is also confirmed by a department in 2015 by way of a circular. And therefore, 56.27b does not apply for an amount received from a non-resident. Rule 11 UA which defines what is fair market value. It gives you an option of net asset value versus a discounted cash flow method. Net asset value is a straightforward formula opening a, the assets and the, the equity plus reserve plus the gentry value or the circle rate of the immobile assets. For the DCA valuation, there is a challenge that you do a valuation, you take the report, the law says you take a report only from a merchant banker, even a chartered accountant or registered value is not allowed for 11 UA and you have to compulsorily take report from a merchant banker. Now that merchant banker when it issues a report, you have to give a projections and when you give a projection we will say we will have a sales of 100, 22, 23, 10%, 15% incremental growth. What will be the amount of profitability? What will be the amount of capex? what will be the amount of the cash generated in the business. And then somebody will value your shares of 10 rupees, say for example at 50 rupees. And you issue shares at a 40 rupees premium. The moment you have issued shares at 40 rupees premium, the department will come and say, please justify fair market value. Then law also got amended from assessment of 1314 in case of section 68 to say, source of source also requires to be demonstrated. The question is that whether these projections which you give for the purpose of arriving at a premium of 40 rupees, is it a sacro set or somebody can dispute this? Now two practical challenges for all of us first and then let me go to a department perspective. The first and foremost that when your client gives you your projections to a merchant banker, there has to be a basis of the assumptions. 
it can't be that every year i will have 15% growth without any basis why 15% that why has to be answered second why i am saying that i will have an say for example i will do a valuation of an hospital in a bangalore what is the occupancy rate what is the general occupancy rate of an hospital industry there are many many research reports available in google many research reports available in the financial world and you will have to take some basis to estimate what is that general expectation of a revenue and if you have a basis of that valuation if you are projected reasonably for that basis then to my opinion there is no requirement to compare with actuals now moment you have raised money under 5627b the first question department will ask please give me your projection versus actual numbers and also send me a revised valuation putting actual numbers on the table now if i have done exceptionally good maybe my valuation would becomes 80 rupees i don't have an issue but if i have not done good in a business if i go by actual numbers my valuation number will come out to 30 rupees and then the question would arise that do i need to make made an addition of 20 rupees now there when you will have to take care to say and that is what consistently the delhi tribunal and yesterday delhi high court and senior star confirmed that view that if you have a reasonable assumptions and the basis for a valuation then the officer is not in a as a um, sorry the officer has no powers to dispute that valuation and compare with an actual because projections are projections of a future and you can't estimate what will happen tomorrow when somebody were would have done valuation in january 20 he would not have expected that 2021 would be subject to covid or a pandemic and therefore you can't expect somebody to do a valuation which is not possible to predict beyond a point of time and therefore if those numbers are reasonable on scientific basis then the officer is not allowed or do not have a power to challenge those numbers but in all fairness whatever i am saying today is all for the tribunal and high court department invariably is making additions under 5627b and everybody is in the litigation today by comparing the actuals versus the projected number but my personal request to all of you that whenever you are face this with issue please submit basis of valuation with assumptions and all numbers so that at least in cit appellate tribunal you should be able to defend appropriately the second issue on 56 to 10 after number of amendments from 2004 till 2017 now law is very simple any person to any person in case of a sum of money it is without without consideration in case of a immoral property or a property it is without consideration or inadequate consideration in between for 2 years from 10 to 13 that word inadequate was not there the question is that whether an issue of shares by a company is also subject to 56 to 10 the supreme court in code distillery is laid down a principle that a share comes into existence only when it is allotted prior to allotment it becomes a part of an authorized capital it is an unappropriated capital and if it is not allotted there is no question of any transfer if it is no transfer of transfer 56 to 10 does not arise and therefore reasonably issue of shares by any company whether it is at premium premium may be subject to 56 to 7b but not under 56 to 10 because 56 to 10 only allows net asset value you do not have an option of a dcf under 56 to 10 and if you go back to a circular of the cbdt the memorandum of explaining provisions it also says that they wanted to capture only transfer of a property or a transfer of a shares and not the allotment of a new shares and therefore it is a preference shares or equity share capital it should not get covered under 56 to 10 and therefore issue of shares one can reasonably take a view about non applicability of 56 to 10 the next issue 
is trading loss versus a bad debts. Section 3617 read with Section 362 provides that the bad debts is eligible as a deduction provided two conditions. One, the income has been offered to taxation in the past, included in the sales in the past, and it is charged to profit and loss account. I am right now dealing with an issue. What do you mean by charge to profit and loss account? Charge means it is debit to profit and loss account or it is only that the data account is squared up in the financial statements. And I go and do not debit that bad debt to a profit and loss account. I go and debit to a capital reserve in the balance sheet. It is not rooted through profit and loss account. I am not going to an accounting issue. I am going only with an assumption that the, it is in compliance with an accounting treatment. The question is that whether a non-debit to a PNL and only squared work of a debtor's account is a charge to profit and loss account. The Supreme Court in Vijaya Bank says that even if you provide and reduce from the gross amount, then also it is a charge to profit and loss account. The Supreme Court in TRF says, you don't need to ask any questions after 1st April 89. The moment I have charged to profit loss account, it is as good as allowed as a write-off under Section 36.2. There the question arose that if somebody wants to take a view that it is not a charge to profit loss account because it is not debited to profit loss account, can I claim alternatively a trading loss under section 28.1. Now what is trading loss per se? I do a business, I incur substantial expenditure on different nature of items, I incur a loss, there may not be a, every section to cover every situation under the law. Say for example, somebody confiscated or somebody did a theft from my office of 1 lakh of rupee or my employee was withdrawing cash from a bank, when he was coming to the office, somebody took, took away one lakh of rupee. Where does this one lakh book will go? There is no section under 28 to 44. Where will I claim this deduction? Supreme Court said way back in 55 ITR and 62 ITR of Nanital Bank, that any loss which is in relation or having a nexus with the business, and it is arising from the business operations, then it is a trading loss if it is not covered under any other provisions of the Act. And therefore the question was that whether these bad debts, which technically one may argue that it is not charged to profit loss account, can I go and claim as a trading loss under 28.1? Possibly answer is yes. Because it is arising from my business, it has a nexus to my business and therefore it is arising from the business operations of the company and therefore it is 28.1. The only difference between 36.2 and trading loss is that section 36.2 says in the year in which I charge to profit loss account, trading loss says in the year in which I discover that loss. Now that's a distinction. If I discover this theft in year 1, then I should have charged to profit loss account and claim in year 1. I can't claim and go in year 2 or year 3. So the year in which I can claim this deduction could be an issue, but otherwise legally I would believe that alternatively I can go and claim as trading loss. And why I am raising this? Again a classic example yesterday I am facing in a faceless. I am a research company. I have an outstanding service tax receivable from the department. I tried to get a set off, but I did not get a set off. Finally, after five years, I decided to charge off to PNL account. The officer is saying under faceless, please prove from a service tax department and get me a certificate that they have not issued a refund of this amount. 
I have given the service tax return which shows that last year I was having a balance of 75 lakhs, current year my balance is zero. I also conveyed that now after 1st July I am into GST, I have not taken a transitory benefits, my GST, whatever accumulated service tax credit has all gone. But he is still insisting till yesterday evening, please produce certificate from a tax department. I also said that there is no provision in the law to give me a certificate that I have not received a refund. And in future, if I get a refund, I will offer under 41.1. But still, they are not giving this deduction on the ground of this argument. The other interesting issue, get a The other interesting issue was on waiver of principal and a loan. I borrow money from a bank. I borrow money under an unsecured loan from a personal sources. For any reason, I fail to repay to the bank. I do a restructuring scheme. I go under insolvency bankruptcy scheme of NCLT. And I ultimately settle at 50%. Or my personal unsecured loans, I settle at 70%. What happens to that waiver of a principal? Or what happens to waiver of the interest amount? There were many, many different judgments of Gujarat High Court, the Madras High Court, the Delhi High Court, the Bombay High Court. And everybody was giving a different color of the money. The Delhi High Court said, if it is a term loan, then waiver of a term loan is not taxable. But if it is a working capital, the waiver of a working capital is taxable. So what is the end use of the borrowing that is relevant for the purpose of taxability. The Madras High Court said, whether it is term loan or the capital, or the working capital, both are taxable on waiver. And therefore you have to pay tax. The Bombay High Court said, neither term loan nor working capital is taxable. The Gujarat High Court in Chetan Chemicals, 267 ITR, laid down a principle that if I write back an unsecured loan, irrespective of the purpose for what it I have used, it is not taxable under 41.1 or under 28.4. The matter travelled to Supreme Court. The matter of the Bombay High Court travel to Supreme Court. But now Delhi and Madras indirectly would get covered by the Supreme Court judgment in Mahindra and Mahindra. So there are three arguments to moot. And why Bomb Madras and the Delhi High Court took that particular view? The genesis lies into a Supreme Court judgment of TVS Sundaram Iyer. 222 ITR. TVS Sundara Mayer Supreme Court said that if I have a customer's deposit and after two years, three years, five years, customers do not come to take the money back or a distributor's deposit. And if I write back that customer or a distributor's deposit, to profit and loss account. The argument of the SSC was 41.1 says unless I have claimed deduction in the past, it is not taxable in the next year. The Supreme Court said no. The customer deposits and the distributor's deposits are in the nature of a trading liability because you had taken this money from the course of your business operations 
and therefore write back of the distributor deposit or a customer's deposit is a taxable amount for the purpose of section 28 when the matter was argued before delhi and madras high court there was also an argument that alternatively it is also taxable under section 28 subsection sub clause 4 what is 28 4 28 4 provides any benefit or perquisite received in the course of business or profession. All high courts are on the same view, including Supreme Court in Mahindra Mahindra, to say some of any benefit or perquisite would, would mean any amount of benefit in kind, not in the form of cash or money. If I have received anything in the form of cash or money, then it does not fall into 28.4. And therefore, the waiver of a principal amount is in the nature of cash or money, and therefore it does not fall into 28.4. What was the fact before Mahindra and Mahindra? Mahindra and Mahindra in 66 imported some assets, machinery, for manufacturing of a Jeep car and he took loan from a foreign supplier. After 10 years, the loan was waived off by the foreign supplier. And the question was that whether that 57 lakhs rupees is a taxable amount or not. The department added, CIT confirmed, tribunal reversed, Bombay High Court said not taxable, Supreme Court confirmed it is not taxable. And what are the principles? One, under 28.4, unless it is in the form of a cash or money, it is, does not fall into a benefit or a perquisite. For the purpose of section 41.1, it has to be in the nature of a trading liability. There is a distinction between a liability and a trading liability. Section 41.1 only refers for a trading liability. When Mahindra and Mahindra borrowed money to buy an asset, was it in the nature of a trading liability? The answer is no. And therefore, it is not taxable as business income or under section 41.1. So if I extend this principle to a waiver of a bank loan, so the bank loan will not be taxable as at either under 28.4 or under 41.1. Somebody can still loosely argue, which I don't believe is a correct argument. That when Supreme Court is saying a distinction between a liability and a trading liability, can a working capital be still be treated as a trading liability? Which I would believe answer is no. It is still in the nature of a liability. I have not claimed deduction in the past years and therefore waiver of a working capital loan also should not get impacted. And therefore my view would be that and going by the Supreme Court judgment in Mahindra and Mahindra, that waiver of a principal amount of bank loan or an unsecured loan or a working capital loan should not get impacted by 41.1 or 28.4. The only challenge would come that from an accounting principle it has to be rooted through profit and loss account and if you are still under an old regime of 30% you are still subject to a MAT liability. If it is a minimum alternate tax liability then there could be a challenge. But there also, because of section 115 JB subsection 6, save as otherwise provided in this act, all other provisions of the act will apply. The courts have started taking a view that if a particular item is not taxable under a normal income, the same cannot also be subject to a MAT liability. So if a waiver of a principal amount of a bank loan is not subject to taxation for a normal income tax, can I still go and argue that it is not taxable under a MAT provision also? But that is a highly debatable issue because I am aware that we have a Supreme Court judgment of Apollo Tires in 255 ATR which says the books of accounts cannot be disturbed by an assessing officer once it is accepted by the auditors and the shareholders. And if it is a balance sheet, it is a sacrosanct financial statement for computing a book profit, 
can i still tweak and say particular item is not taxable for mat particular item is still taxable for mat interestingly some tribunal in the south has gone a step further that for for computing a capital gain tax liability you have an indexation benefit under 48 even for mat liability you should be allowed an indexation benefit it is it is a very stretching too far but that is what the one of the tribunal says even an indexation benefit should be applied to computer book profit on an interest portion it will all be governed by section 43b if i provided a liability in the past i would have claimed deduction subject to 43b so in the subsequent year when i do a waiver of a interest amount if i have already claimed deduction the 43b in the past it will be subject to taxation in the current year if not then answer is no there is no question of 411 or 284 because anyway i have not claimed deductions under 43b let me go a step further on 284 a interesting judgment of a madras high court in boeing today in the market all distributors all marketing people gets a incentives in the form of a kind if you achieve this particular sales turnover in the current year i will give you a two wheeler of 20000 rupees i will give you a motorcycle of 70000 rupees i will give you a gold coin i will take you to a mauritius for a pleasure trip along with your family all all these link to your performance as a distributor or a salesman or a marketing what happens to those gifts which i received in kind or if i am given a pleasure trip to us because i did i give a excellent advice to my client and i decided not to charge fees and therefore in lieu of that he allows me to go to us and spend 10 lakhs what will happen to that this is all benefit or perquisite in the course of business or profession this is all taxable so if i have received a gold coin technically i should credit profit and loss account and i should debit gold coin in my balance sheet if i receive a two wheeler or a four wheeler or any other article in the performance of my distributor or a sales salesman then i have to offer this for income tax or if as a chartered accountant i get a perquisite of an us trip i have to offer that for income tax and then claim a personal expenditure so this is all benefits of perquisite now why i am saying this let me go a step further the purpose for raising this issue i have seen in bombay that whenever a large fmcg company and pharma company debits expenditure on sales and distribution they ask for the people of distributors and salesmen name with their pen number and department has started issuing notices to those i am not on that medical expenses of the doctors i am not on that issue simple performance based incentives and distributors have started notices getting notices across the india that have you offered this for taxation because i am claiming a deduction in case of an fm come do i need to deduct tds under 194 bb as company again answer is no 194 bb only covers lottery and lottery means it's a pure game of a chance this is not chance i have performed and therefore i have got this incentive if you go and play a house in a rajput club yes it is a game of chance and therefore there 194 bb will apply but not in the articles which you receive in the performance of your duty as professional or as distributor or anybody else and therefore this is not subject to a tds under section 194 capital bb 
as a lottery, unlike the Rajput Club situation. The last issue before I go to two, three TDS issues is on the previous year expenditure. What I find many times when I see a statement of income or a profit and loss account, people go by a dates of the transaction. I'm sorry, not even a date of a transaction, date of an invoice for the purpose of treating this as a previous year expenditure. What is previous year expenditure? You have an accounting principle to say any error or omission is a prior period expenditure. Have I committed an error? Have I committed a mistake in not recording that particular expenditure? Then answer is yes, it is a pure previous year expenditure. But if there was a dispute between the two parties and it gets settled after two years, it is not a previous year expenditure, even it was because the liability to pay crystallized only after two years when the dispute got resolved. And therefore, Saurabh would have said about the Excel Industries judgment on the income principles. And the same Excel Industries applies here, what is accrued, both right to pay and right to receive. So unless I have a right to receive and you have a right to pay, liability is not accrued. And if a liability is not accrued, it is not an a certain expenditure. And if it is not an accrued expenditure, it is not in the nature of a previous year expenditure. And therefore, one has to take care as far as the previous year expenditure is concerned. But even if it is a previous year expenditure, then coincidentally the Gujarat High Court in Adani Enterprise does take a view that if the rate of taxation is same over a period of time, there is no advantage of a revenue loss and therefore you should be granted a deduction even in the subsequent year <coughs> when there was a previous year expenditure. On the TDS, on the software and the recent Supreme Court judgment, so let me just explain broadly the principles. Softwares are normally of two or three kinds. One, what we normally say off the shelf for a standard software. You go and buy Tele, you go and buy Microsoft 2008 editions, you go and buy some other Oracle licenses. These are all standard software. But in every software, there is an agreement, which is called end user license agreement. Along with that agreement, there is a provision that you are only given a license to use. And there is no transfer of an ownership. The question is that when I buy that software, do I need to deduct a TDS? The department, if you read section 916 on royalty, the first line, any payment for use or right to use for an intangible asset including granting of a license. Now that word granting of a license department says the software supplier has given you a license to use. It is nothing but a royalty. And then the department inserted explanation 5 with retrospective effect from April 76 to say all payment over software is a royalty. So as far as domestic tax is concerned, the dispute is closed all software payments are in the nature of royalty. Then department also issued a notification on 13th June 2012, effective from 1st July 2012, to say that to avoid cascading effect of TDS under 194J, if a first person has already deducted a TDS, the subsequent people doesn't have to deduct TDS. See, if I am a distributor of a Microsoft, I purchase from a Microsoft first time, I deduct TDS at 10% of 194J, then subsequently when I purchase from the distributor, if I, if I give a declaration that I have already deducted at the first instance, the ultimate purchaser doesn't have to deduct TDS, 
because somebody has already deducted TDS and to avoid a cascading effect of 10% on every transaction. And that notification is still valid. The question was that if the same software I buy from a non-resident, will the treatment be same? Because that notification of 1st, 13th June 2012 also applies to payments under 195. And therefore the question was that whether that is also applicable to a non-resident payment. And finally, Supreme Court settled that dispute in the recent judgment five days back to say that if it is a standard software where only a license is given to use because what is given to me is only a license and there is a terminology which is being used is called copyrighted article versus a copyright. This is nothing but a copyrighted article. It is not a copyright within the meaning of the Copyright Act. It is similar to you buy a textman book or a Chaturvedi book or a Palkhiwala book. Do you have to deduct a TDS? Answer is no. Because he is not giving you, like for example, tomorrow, the AGFT can't buy one book and distributes all of you free of charge. Otherwise, they will violate the Copyright Act. And therefore, it is only for your personal purpose, only for your commercial purpose, not to reproduce copies. And therefore, it does not become a copyright. It is a copyrighted article. And therefore, it does not fall into a definition of a royalty under the treaty position. So today, if you buy a software from Microsoft Singapore or from a US, then you are not required to deduct TDS at the 195. Payment of a commission. There are huge disputes going on, on as far as the payment of exports commission is concerned. Law is reasonably settled, but department is not settled. Department has to have disallowed this amount on some ground or the other ground. Now why I raise this issue for two interesting points. In every notice, they will ask you two things. One, the commission has accrued in India and therefore you should have deducted TDS under 195 for an exports commission. And then they refer some two judgments of the authority for advance ruling. And the second argument is that please submit agreement, please submit proof of evidences about the genuineness of the payment. In 7 out of 10 cases, we normally reply only on the first issue. We normally may not reply appropriately in the second issue. And then every order when they pass, he will first stylize your second issue that payment of commission is not genuine. Now there is no requirement under the law that I must have an agreement with everybody. But yes, onus is on me to demonstrate that the commission is genuine for the services rendered. If I am not able to demonstrate that services are rendered and therefore commission is genuine, officer may be in right to disallow that expenditure under 37.1. Forget 40.1. And therefore it is my duty and onus and not only that, I was reading an article few days back which also stretch that view to say that suppose if the commission is not genuine, whether the person who has received commission has to pay tax as a business income or under section 68 read with 11 by BBE at 60% because it is a credit amount for which it is not genuine receipt. Maybe answer is right, answer is no, I am not going into that. I am only trying to say somebody can stretch that argument. And therefore, onus will be on me to say that commission is genuine and I must submit all evidences of mails, documents, if there are agreements and agreements to prove that the commission is given only for the purpose of services rendered. And then, as far as the TDS is concerned, since the foreign party does not have a business connection or permanent establishment, there is no requirement to deduct TDS. You will need appropriate documentation to collect, 
but then TDS is not required to be deducted. All Ahmedabad tribunal judgments are consistent, including Gujarat High Court and Vinayak export to say that TDS on the foreign commission is not required to be deducted. The next issue is on the property transaction from a non-resident. If I go and buy a property from a non-resident, in 8 out of 10 cases I have seen that all non-resident declare themselves as a resident and then the payer deducts TDS under 194IA. While filing is written, he will still file as a non-resident. But in the agreement for sale or a sale deed, he discloses himself as a resident. Now from a payer perspective, I would believe that if he has misrepresented, I may not be at fault. I have deducted a TDS under 194i. As far as my obligations under TDS are concerned, I have a bona fide belief to say. But otherwise, Normally, these transactions are also subject to a TDS provisions. Ideally, one should go and take a certificate under 197.1 from a department to say on what amount TDS is required to be deducted. Or you have an obligation to deduct TDS on the gross amount. Now that will be extremely unfair because in a property transaction, the property is worth 1 crore, you go and buy 22% on 1 crore, may not be that tax on the capital gain and therefore there is somebody else who has to go and take a refund. And therefore, ideally one should get a certificate from a department of 197.1 to get a lower TDS certificate. Next issue is on the All India Adjustments. Right now under the assessments, unfortunately, or fair value measurements which are creditor or debitor to profit and loss account, the officer is not able to appreciate and understand and therefore he raises issue on all India's adjustment about that whether this amount is taxable or not taxable or even that fair value measurement amount is required to be calculated for the purpose of 3613 or for the purpose of rule 8D and 14A for the purpose of disallowance of an interest or disallowance of any other item for an India's adjustments. And therefore one will have to legally it is not taxable, legally it is not deductible Fair value is all about, a, a, it's not a part of a real income principles and therefore it is not required to be subject to a disallowance but one will have to take care and explain appropriately about this item. The last two items is on section 271 AAD penalty. A CBDT issued a circular in January 21 only because of all GST fake invoices and say that the all investigation officers should take care about penalty under section 271 AA-D. Now why I am raising this issue, it is very, very serious. The law says that if the amount is false entry or it is omission of any entry to evade any tax liability. And then the false entry is defined to say any circular transaction means a supply of goods where the good doesn't exist or it is a circular trading from A to B to C to D to E and which happens today in the market in number of cases. It may not be an actually revenue loss. If I take from a GST perspective, uh, A sells goods to B, B takes credit, B sells goods to C, C takes credit and there is a circular, there is no revenue loss. But technically, it is a false entry from a penalty perspective. Similarly, if certain expenses are found to be without evidences or without bona fide explanation, then this also becomes a false entry in the financial statements. Or an omission of an expenses, 
So you have certain expenses which are not accounted. It may fall into section 69C as unaccounted investments or unaccounted expenditure. But it is also subject to penalty under 271AAD. And then the law says penalty is 100% to the person who commits plus person who abets. So on 100 rupee amount, the penalty is 200 rupees, one for the taxpayer and somebody else. Now that somebody else could be a professional, somebody else could be a businessman who has abetted in this transaction. And therefore, particularly the professional will have to take an extra care to say that you don't fall into 271 AAD penalty. Because many times, without evidence is a very, very subjective argument. I may have debited an expense, but I may not have five documents to demonstrate, though it is genuine, though it is actually the services are rendered, but somebody can come and say that no, it is not genuine. And therefore, one will have to take appropriate care from that angle. The last issue, which I believe Mr. Hauja would have dealt with on the PF and ESIC yesterday, is already dead, no? Ah, to be sure, no. In length, ne? Bahut sir. Acha. Okay. Very good. Okay. And the last issue is on the TDS on the marketing services and the payment of lawyers' fees or a CA, the chartered accountant CPA fees. And I am again raising this issue is for a particular reason. I have a commission agent outside India. I pay a commission at 3% for every sales generated. I have an agreement with him. But if you go and read an agreement, there is a very thin line of distinction between a commission payment and a marketing services payment. Marketing services means he will give me a market information, he will give me a computer's information, he will give me the computer products information, he will give me what are the distrib who are the distributors in the market, which people are willing to buy your products, all this information he will give me in the market. Now this information even a commission agent will give you. So the question is that what is that dominant objective of that payment? What is your principal purpose for which you are making that payment? Are you making for generating a sales or are you making payment for those services? If it is a commission, then as I said earlier, no TDS is required. But if it is a pure marketing services, then the answer could be different. Because 917 provides a fees for technical services to say technical managerial consultancy services. And these marketing services may fall into a managerial services or a consultancy services. And therefore the question of TDS will come. The same language is also in the text treaties with majority of the countries. Except I am not going into the detail, but in certain treaties you have a principle of a make available where you can go out of the taxability. But otherwise, in majority of the treaties, you will have a challenge of deducting the TDS on a marketing services. And the same principle holds good for the professional services. Now the only additional angle to professional services is that if the recipient is an individual or a partnership firm, because in foreign countries, our lawyers can also run, do a business through a private limited. In India, the lawyers are not allowed to carry on business through a private limited company. But in foreign countries, they are allowed to do business in private limited company. If it is running a business in a partnership firm or an individual, which is in the nature of a professional fee, then under the tax treaty, it is called an independent personal services. Independent personal services, if he has not visited India, then you are not required to deduct TDS. But if it is a company, then it will go to fees for technical services. The professional services will be a part of a technical services and therefore you will have to go and deduct the TDS. So one will have to take care between the, the, the recipient status 
from the tax residency certificate and also from the nature of payment that whether it is in the nature of the professional fees or in the nature of marketing services because why I raise that issue on marketing and commission is that many times we ourselves loosely draft that argument without understanding the complexity which would arise in future when you give and go into the tax department or in a lighter tone we do cut copy and paste and in that cut copy and paste sometimes the color of the transaction and the actual nature of the transaction changes and then you face a challenge after giving to a tax department thank you thank you sir thank you for your dedication at the hands of our eminent speaker ca dinar shah sir i i would uh, uh, request dinar shah sir to kindly do the honors of felicitating the team members as i call out their names uh, starting with advocate rupesh shah sir uh starting with advocate rupesh shah sir followed by followed by bharat jani then ca ritesh gandhi chartered accountant ca uh, ca ritesh gandhi piyush panchal sir advocate dipesh shakwala advocate kanu k h kathiria advocate k h kathiria please let give them a huge round of applause advocate parth kathiria and finally advocate path kathiria sir thank you sir uh, i would request the dignitaries or and finally path kathiria give them a big hand our technical session thank you